Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Understanding perform perf Performance Bond. My name is Vivian and I'm an associate with Maureen Coin Associates. I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's session, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Maureen Coin Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Maureen Our ABLE team today comprises of 23 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication and arbitration, industrial relations team and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But since the implementation of the COVID-19 movement control order, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, in-house counsel, and we have continued this practice until RMCO now. This is in fact our 25th talk in our MWK online talk series, and today we're expecting of about 126 people who have registered online. Please feel free to visit our website at, www at www.mauinkwai.com for more information on what each of our team does, our online products, to read our articles and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you require specific legal advice, please feel free to contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. Now allow me to introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker is Ms. Christine To. She is our partner in our dispute resolution department. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of 
Business Systems from Monash University and a Bachelor of Law from the University of London. She was admitted to the High Court of Malaya in 2014. Christine is also a member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and a Certified Educator and panel with the Asian International Arbitration Centre. Christine's practice areas include construction, education, arbitration and litigation, taxation, family and contractual disputes. Following Christine is our next speaker, Ms. Wong Suen. Suen is an associate in our dispute resolution, employment and individuals and families departments. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from University of London and was admitted to the High Court of Malaya in 2018. Suen's practice areas include general litigation, debt, reco debt recovery, probate and administration of estate, construction and family law matters. Our speakers hope to complete today's talk by 3.45 p.m. and thereafter proceed with a Q&A session. If you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido and we will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during, our, during your registration for this talk, but I will leave this slide up for a short while so that you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can go to Slido's webpage on the left-hand corner of my slide www.slido and key in the code 29789. Our speakers today will cover the following top points, which is what are performance bonds, how are performance bonds interpreted, when and how to call upon a performance bond, and how to restrain a call on performance bond. With that said, I will now pass the floor to Christine. Over to you, Christine. Um, hi, uh, I believe that the speaker should be um, Suen. Suen will go first. Over to you. <laughs> Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Vivian, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So without further ado, let's start today's talk, which is what are, what are performance bonds? So performance bonds are typically provided by a financial institute, such as a bank or an insurance company. It is also very commonly found in construction industry because it is as a form of security for the performance of the contract. This is likely due to the size and the amount involved in the construction contract. So it's very common to find um, this sort of a performance bond there. A performance bond is actually a contract between the bank and the person entitled to receive the performance bond. So in this case, it, the, the person will be a beneficiary or an employer. So meaning the person at the receiving end of the contract. But um, this contracted sum for the performance bond is not provided by the employer. Instead, it's provided by the principal or the contractor at the beneficiary's request. So it is a separate contract from the underlying construction contract, which is between the employer and the contractor. This performance bond, uh, when people say there's a call and performance bond, the call is done by the beneficiary. Okay, so to ease your understanding, we have this diagram right here. As you can see, there are two different types of contract. One is the underlying construction contract and one is the performance bond. The performance bond is between the guarantor, uh, which is the bank or, or an insurance company. And, and the other one is, is with the beneficiary and the employer. It is, uh, I just need to stress that it's a totally separate contract from the construction contract. So, and if you can see on the left-hand side, the payment is made by the principal, the contractor, to the bank. So if let's say um, uh, the, the city hired a contractor to do maintenance work on, the, uh, to, to refurbish the road, so they will, they will ask for the contractor to give a performance bond, which is to guarantee the performance of the contract and so that it gives the, the city some sort of a security wise in hiring the contractor to perform the contract. How are performance bond interpreted? Additionally, performance bond uh, are separated into two categories, as can be seen in this case. Uh, Kona Jaya Sundran Bahat versus Prabadanan Urus Niagar Slar. Urus Ayes Solango. So this case states the traditional view of it, which is the con which is traditional bo uh, performance bonds are classified into a conditional bond and an unconditional 
or an on-demand bond. But uh, courts nowadays prefer a more straightforward exercise of construction or interpretation of the bond so as to discover the intention of the parties. So what it really means is that the court will look at the terms of the performance bond before they decide how, how should the call be done and what is the underlining contractor terms governing the performance bond instead of trying to classify it solely into those two categories. The Connor Jaya case also states that, that, that right now we can see that uh, we've moved on to three types of performance bond. One is that um, the, it's no more than a mere written demand. So what it means is that you can call on a performance bond merely by giving a written demand and that's all they're required. You, you don't have to go on any further, you just need to state that you just need to have a proper written demand. The second category is that in addition to the demand, the demand must assert that a failure ha that there was a failure or that there was a breach of the contract. Third category is that in uh, the third category is that in addition to all the above, you need proof that uh, of what you have asserted before you can call the performance bond. So let me see, you need proof that you have suffered that breach and it's, and not just a mere assertion that there was a breach. The first category, uh, which is the a mere written demand is sufficient. Okay. So in this court of your case, in Technic Chakap Sendrian Bahat, the court said that there is a category of performance bond wherein uh, the performance bond must be paid merely on a demand being made and whether this is so must depend on the wording of the bond itself. So what it means is that looking at the terms of the performance bond, uh, as long as your, you made a proper demand, you, it's a written form, that's it, that's sufficient to call on the performance bond. You don't need to take any other further step. You don't need to prove it. You don't need to assert that there was a breach. You just need to make a demand. An example would be in this case, Karya Lajinda Sundaram Bahat. This case uh, it is a federal court case. So what happened was uh, the Court of Appeal and the High Court held that this, perform this particular performance bond in WALF uh, was an unconditional and undemand bank guarantee which means that what was required was just that, a demand. So, and this is all because of uh, a particular clause there, wherein, uh, as shown on the screen here, this is the, the clause in the performance bond. And the part that I highlighted that, it says that on the principal's demand, notwithstanding any contestation or protest by the contractor or by the guarantor or by any other third party. So the court interpreted this phrase to mean that this performance bond is an on-demand performance bond. The court held that, so uh, payment would only be made by the bank once a valid letter of demand is received and it is relevant whether there is any protest or contestation. The contractor's remedy is to sue in damages. The implication of such a clause is that payment must be made upon receipt of a valid demand. So what the court states that, um, the federal court said that if there is an issue, the remedy for it is not here, it is not for the court. The court is not required to consider whether um, the demand is valid or not because your performance bond states that um, as long as there is a valid demand, as long as there's a valid written demand, then the bank should release the money. So there was no necessity for the demand letter to ascertain that there was a breach. In our second example, in this case of Esso Petroleum Malaysia, this is a Supreme Court case, and I have extracted um, the clause from the performance bond. And the main, the court interpreted this phrase, and we hereby unconditionally and irrevocably guarantee the payment to EPMI to mean that this was a pure on-demand guarantee wherein um, 
there is no requirement to give any declaration or documentation as to any breach of the contract. The court further held that since the performance bond was on demand performance bond, there was independent of any underlying contract between the parties involved, which in this case it was a contractor and the main con, uh, a contractor and the sub con. Um, therefore, it was not open to the judge to inquire into any breach of such underlying contract as he seemed to have done. So the Supreme Court held that as long as there is a valid demand, it was uh, the bank should have released the, the performance bond. Our second category of cases uh, are where cases where in addition to a demand, the demand must have asserted a failure uh, to perform a certain term in the contract. So what it means is that the words of the performance bond require the beneficiary to expressly state in its demand the basis for calling the performance bond. And a failure to do so will render the call invalid and unenforceable. Uh, my, my colleague Christine will explain further on what it means to, uh, to have the call challenged in court. But this is a very important point to understand is that when there are when the performance bond clearly states this, in a, you must state, uh, when the performance bond has such a clause, you must expressly state in your demand what, what kind of failure there is, uh, what kind of failure occurred. Okay, so in this case of technique checkups in Ryan Berhard, the performance bond states that, uh, it was stated in the performance bond that if the subcontractor shall in any respect fail to execute the contract or commit any breach of its obligation thereunder, then the guarantor shall pay. So, in the letter of demand calling for the performance bond, what was stated was, we hereby give you notice that we wish to make a claim for the full amount against the above said performance bond. The court of her held that nothing in the demand mentioned that the contractor had failed to perform the subcontract or that it had committed a breach. The appellate had failed to assert the very basis of the demand as required by the bond, and hence the call was invalid. Uh, so, what? So, okay. In the terms, it states that shall to execute the contract or commit any breach of the obligation. Whereas in the letter of demand, it was only a call that the, there was a failure to state what kind of breach there was, uh, what kind of breach that the contractor had failed to perform in the subcontract. And hence the call was invalid. In our next example, sorry, and the third category of cases here is that in addition to asserting that there was a uh, breach, there must be proof that there must be proof that the that there was a breach and that you had like suffered something from the breach. Okay. This category of cases was uh, seen in the case of Supreme Court in ESO Petroleum, which held that uh, condition to include the production of the document, uh, example, a certificate from some nominated independent person like an architect, or an inquiry by the guarantor into the existence of any breach of the contractual obligation between the principal and the beneficiary. So for example, in this case of Kinning Exiton, this is a very recent 2020 case, um, the performance, the wording of the performance bond was that the guarantor further covenants and agree that the contractor shall pay to the employer on demand such sum as the employer may certify being indemnified against any losses, damages, damage costs or expenses incurred by the employer by reason of any default or breach on the part of the contractor on his obligation under the contract. So in this case, the judge said that in order to call the performance bond, um, you need to make a positive assertion and there must be a certification 
notify an authorized person that you have incurred damages. This is because um, the court held that I find and I hold that it is also a condition of the performance bond that the first defendant must certify the sum of the loss, damage, costs, or expenses incurred by the first defendant in the making of the demand. So here, there, you need to prove, it's not just a mere assertion, you need to prove that there was some form of loss, damage, costs, or expenses. This is because in this performance one, the judges interpreted it, uh, the word incurred used in the, in the performance form is past tense. So it emphasized that uh, the alleged cost must have already been expended. So that's why the judge, they held that uh, you must certify that you have suffered some form of loss first in your performance uh, when you are calling for the performance bond. Hence, the court found that the demand issued by the employer is premature as the employer in his call on the performance bond stated that the council intends to take the bank guarantee. And for the judge, this is not a sufficient assertion that there was a, that a, a, a this is not a positive assertion that you are demanding for a performance bond. You are just, um, it, it just shows your intent, but it's not strong enough to be an assertion. Furthermore, I say that a meticulous review doesn't mean that it was certified by the proper person as required by the performance bond. Uh, in this case, the proper person was actually the employee himself. So that's why the judge found that the call made was premature in that case. And now I'll pass on to my colleague Christine and she will explain further on when you can call performance bond and how can you call performance bond. Christine, over to you. Thanks, Glenn. I'll share my screen now. So I'm going to um, thanks, Glenn, for uh, taking through us the first two points of the top points. I'll continue on with the uh, when and how we can call upon a performance bond is relatively a short um, top point. Actually, the bulk of my topic today will be actually looking at cases and see how uh, court interpret how, how court looked at uh, cases where we try to restrain the calling of performance bond by way of uh, asking for an injunction. Okay. First of all, when to call on a performance bond? Basically, you can call anytime as long as the bond is still valid. Okay, so the validity of the terms pretty much depends on your terms of the contract, the underlying construction contract. Um, for example, I've uh, put up PAM. For PAM, usually it's 5% uh, of the contract price are sum, and it has to be valid three months after the contractual date of completion. So anytime from there, you can call. But of course, it depends on the terms of the performance bond itself and whether it has been um, expanded or not. And of course, you have uh, our quite commonly used as well, our PWD in Malaysia. Um, the sum is 5% of the contract sum as well, but uh, the validity is uh, way longer compared to PAM. Uh, the, the performance bond usually has to be valid for 12 months after the expiry of the CLP or the issuance of uh, CMGD. GMGD being certificate of making good defects, whichever is later. I use this um, construction contract, standard form construction contract, simply because um, I deal with a lot of construction cases. I'm sure that uh, there are other contracts other than construction contracts which requires performance bonds. These are just examples, by no means exhaustive. So, um, that's when, and uh, in terms of how. So, um, when has uh, bring us through how, uh, whether there is uh, the demand has to be just a pure demand, or whether you need to assert a failure, or whether you need to prove there is um, a breach. So, the calling of the performance bonds, i.e. the demand itself from the beneficiary. Let's take an example of we have an employer and contractor um, scenario where the contractor gave the performance bond to the uh, employer at the request of the employer, of course, and uh, the beneficiary of the, uh, 
employer being the beneficiary, and of course the guarantor will usually be the bank. So it depends on the uh, terms of the performance bond. The let's say for example the employer wants to call on the bond. So what we call that call is actually the demand. So that demand by the employer will also have to depend on the terms of the performance bond. If it says that, oh, it's a pure demand, then the employer, all it has to say is that I hereby demand, I mean, wrote to the, write to the bank and say that I hereby demand you release this performance, uh, this sum guarantee under the performance bond to me. So it depends on the terms of the performance bond, which uh, Gwen has uh, brought it through um, just now. And uh, what happens is that usually the main contractor will be notified if the uh, employer wants to call on the bond. The bank will usually give the, uh, the um, contractor a call and say that it looks, the employer is calling on the bond. So this is where it brings me to the next topic, how to restrain. How to restrain a call on performance bond. What we have to do is actually run to the court, rush to the court, and ask for what we call an injunction. Usually this kind of uh, application, I mean injunction application, is very, it has to be done very quickly because the, usually the bank will call you, when the bank call you, but I mean when the bank, the bank called the contractor, the demand has already been made. So anytime the bank can release the money. So, and hence that is the reason why injunction has to be filed very, very promptly. Okay. So then what this injunction will do, if in the event it was granted by court, number one, it will, I mean, it can be either, either or, depends on circumstances. First, the, either, uh, number one, the bank will be prevented from releasing the sum under the performance bond. Or the beneficiary, i.e. in this case, what our, our scenario just now will be, the employer will be restrained from receiving any demand, uh, uh, sorry, receiving any payment, or restrain from making any demand if the demand has not been made yet. So you see all of these are uh, the, the prayers that I have just said to you is pretty much preventing someone, be it the bank or the employer, from doing something. And that is the crux of the, the purpose of an injunction, to stop someone from doing something. And uh, the, the governing law for um, applying an injunction is the English case law, which is our very well-known American Sinomat. And it has been uh, many, many times adopted in the, in the Malaysian court. I will very briefly tell you uh, what are the tests. But these are not the juicy part. Like, okay? The juicy part is really to look at the facts of each case and uh, to, to let you know what happened and the facts of each different cases. So the law is that when you apply for an injunction, you need to show that there is number one, bona fide serious issue to be tried. Number two, that damages is not an adequate remedy. And number three is the balance of convenience lean in favor of you, if you are the applicant. Of course, if you are the one who are opposing the injunction, of course you have to um, rebut it the other way. So, um, back to our topic of uh, restraining a call in, the, in this uh, performance bond. Generally, the court is actually uh, slow, I would say slow in interfering if that the demand made is, uh, is a good demand. You see, if let's say they uh, comply with the requirement of the performance bond, be it a pure demand, be it asserting a breach, or be it proof of breach, as long as the demand by itself complies with that condition, the court is generally um, real, how do I say real, slow, I would say slow in interfering. So just whatever, usually the, the dispute between the parties, you see, like what Gwen has told us earlier on, performance bond on one hand is between the bank and the employer state. Where else the underlying contract is between the employer and the contractor. So this part of it, the court is like, most of the time the dispute between the parties, the main contractor and the subcontractor, it has to do with this, the construction contract. So the construction contract will have their own dispute mechanism, uh, dispute resolution mechanism. 
So the court will usually say that, look, go for arbitration or go to court to resolve the problem between the both of you here under this construction contract. The bank guarantee, the performance bond, is a separate thing between the bank and the employer. So, and hence that's the reason why they are reluctant. And of course, in the, uh, in the, and also because the purpose of a performance bond. You see, when you give out a on-demand bond, when the contractor gives out an on-demand bond, it's sort of like um, giving up, like, okay, wh whatever it is, you can call for it. So it is a form of a security. It's, it's a very crucial thing. I mean, as an employer, they feel secure that I at least have this 5% of hand, if anything. So, and hence, that's why in Echo Petroleum, the court actually say that trustworthiness is actually a byword for doing a business. Performance bond play a crucial role in causing more business to be formed and transacted. So that's the purpose of a performance bond to begin with. And of course, in this uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, the judges actually make reference to an English case law and uh, they, they, which says that actual performance bond is like a lifeblood of international comments, uh, comments, uh, commerce. So, and it actually shows the sentiment that except that it's a clear case of fraud where, where the bank has noticed, and then the court, apart from that, right, the court will actually leave the contractor, leave the employer to settle their dispute under the construction contract by either arbitration or litigation. The construction contract is on is one thing, and the performance bond is another thing. So that is the um, general rule. But having said that, the court also recognized that this sort of strict interpretation may cause injustice. So this is where the um, where the um, let's say bring go back to that top the the scenario that we have. The employer used this uh, the calling of performance bond as a as an oppressive instrument to force the co and contractor to do something or not to do something. Or then that's where the court will have to step in to intervene to prevent injustice. So there are two instances where the court may allow an application to restrain the calling of the performance bond. Initially, there's only one actually. Yeah which is fraud. And in recent years, the court has also um, opened up for another class of cases, which is where there is a proof of unconscionable conduct. And then that's where the court may allow the application for an injunction. We will, I, will look, I will share with you guys the cases in, uh, in reference to fraud and unconscionable, unconscionability. But actually, most of the time, when we go to court, if there's any application to restrain the calling of an injunction uh, on the premise of fraud, it's usually hand by hand, we will plead both fraud and unconscionable conduct. But actually, both are different. I, I will, I'll show you that shortly. So what is fraud? Fraud is basically cheating, deceit, dishonesty. This, um, Fraud, of course, in like every other, uh, in any other yeah, cost paper, it must be specifically pleaded in the sense that you must spell out clearly how fraud happened in your cost paper. By you just saying that, oh, they defrauded me, just by making this kind of allegation will not suffice. All right, uh, I will show with you two cases where um, incident of fraud was uh, pleaded. So in King B, what happened is that the employer did not pay within the 30 day period for the first two and also the subsequent three uh, certificates. And then, uh, then the contractor was not happy and they sent the notice of termination on the ground of breach of contract because you don't want to pay me. And then the employer in return said that uh, there's no sign of construction, nobody was at the site. And also, I have already informed you that further delay, any further delay, I will charge you LAD. And then after that, the employer made a call on the performance bond. So the court, the court actually held that the fact that the defendant, the employer like in, that, in this case, didn't make the payment 
within the 30 days time does not amount to fraud. So that is one example where it does not amount to fraud. And also the, the court actually went on to say that the call on the performance bond by the employer was actually a, a, is a bona fide claim. And hence the injunction was disallowed. That was King B, where fraud was pleaded and uh, the court held that uh, it doesn't amount, what the employer did was does not amount to fraud and hence the injunction was disallowed. The next one is um, LEC contractor. This is a, quite a well-known case as well. And uh, the, the examples of fraud that was uh, given in that case was that the beneficiary demand call for the bond when they themselves already breached the contract. That is uh, some element of uh, bad faith. And then, of and also the beneficiary failed to disclose material facts to the bank. And because there was some dispute on, uh, going on between the parties already, as, uh, as you guys may already know, um, the, what, the, what the principal was saying that the beneficiary is trying to use a backdoor to attempt to obtain the payment of the performance bond, which is 4.8 million, without going for arbitration first. So of course, LED um, contractor in, in that case, the court actually said that number one, fraud must be specifically pleaded. And uh, whatever that the principal stated is actually not in terms of fraud, but they are just disputes between the parties. You say this, I say that, you, see a, you say A, I say B. So the court said that these are not fraud. These are just your own disputes. Go and settle a dispute somewhere in arbitration or uh, court. And that it will not affect the performance bond. That, that go back to what Suen has just shared with us. That, that the bank guarantee, the performance bond, and the underlying contract are different things. So these are fraud. As you can see, in both cases that I have uh, shared, uh, both also was not uh, successful in terms of uh, pleading fraud, raising fraud as a, as, a, as a ground to restrain the calling of a performance bond. Next, I will touch on unconscionability. It's until what I would, before Sumatech, actually there are already cases seems to suggest that unconscionability should be a ground apart from fraud. And Sumatra is our federal court decision and it, it confirmed that unconscionability may be raised as a distinct ground to restrain the calling of the performance board. So the next question that you will have is that, so what's the, what's the difference between fraud and unconscionability? It sounds almost the same, but in fact, they are of apple and orange. And the doctrine of unconscionability, instead, back, rewind a bit, just now what I say about fraud is cheating. Where else for unconscionability is uh, preventive, prevention of oppression, unfairness. In the Kajurita and Bintai, this was what was said. It involved unfairness, or, I mean, and, uh, the definition, so to speak, the like, definition of uh, what is unconscionability unfairness, the conduct of a kind which is so reprehensible, lack of good faith, and of course the court actually said that by mere breach, a breach of contract does not in itself amount to unconscionability. Again, like I said, breach of contract, deal, parties just have to deal with it in arbitration or litigation later on. It has nothing to do with the performance form but only in circumstances where the call on the bond was abusive, it was so unfair, so lacking of good faith, that the court would intervene. So what amount to what I've just said, unfair, lacking of good faith, and uh, abusive, so that's where, because the issue, the notion of uh, unconscionability is actually very, very fact sensitive. It really depends on the fact of the case. And I cannot give you a list of things to say that, oh, if you hit this, if this, this, then it's unconscionability. There's no such thing. The court will look at the entire circumstances of the things, of uh, the factual matrix between the parties, and to come to a conclusion whether there was unconscionability in that, at, that, at the calling of the performance form. Okay. So let's look at the... Uh, Sumatek, the well-known Sumatek Federal Court decision. What happened is that uh, Sumatek was appointed by MRC 
as a contractor. And the contract is actually for the design, supply, fabrication, and erection of structural steel for a Malacca refinery plant. So the initial contract was actually quite huge, uh, 47.8 million. And hence, uh, the, this uh, Somata has to give a 10% performance bond, which is 4.7 million. So, and, but, however, due to certain uh, VOs, in a sense, omissions, the contract value was reduced tremendously, tremendously from 47, 47 million to 13 million. Actually, I still have a lot of a few cases to share with you, so I, I need to talk a little bit faster. Okay. So upon completion, these uh, once I'm done with the work already, Somatec raised two claims. And I said that look, that's a 4.3 please pay me. In return, MRC say that no, 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 I want to backcharge you. I want to backcharge you, and but before that, they never give any notice of defect. And they didn't also give uh, Somatec any opportunity to rectify the so-called uh, defect. And also Somatec said that you already give me a provisional certificate without saying any of all these defects. So yeah, provisional acceptance certificate was already issued. Not with, notwithstanding all these so-called your back charges. Lah. Then in return, uh, Somatec also said that minutes of meeting, correspondence to show that actually parties were still negotiating uh, to resolve their, 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 their differences, trying to negotiate, trying to uh, come to an amicable settlement. So in high court, uh, of course then this uh, MRC call, and uh, Somatec was informed by the bank, MRC called on the performance bond, and uh, Somatec was informed by the bank, and then Somata was saying that MRC is doing so, in doing so, acted in Malafide. Because we are already pending negotiations. All these things you are saying that uh, I got defects and all these things, you never tell me before. You gave me provisional acceptance certificate, so on and so forth. And now you call on the bond. So they go to run, they go, they go to court and say that this are uh, this uh, Malafide and intention to enrich itself. Well, in the High Court, so this one go all the way from High Court Federal uh, Court of Appeal to the Federal Court. In High Court, the uh, judge seems to, I mean, agree with uh, Sumatek and say that what MRC did was unconscionable and hence they allowed their application. However, uh, in Court of Appeal, the decision was overturned. So the Court of Appeal say that, number one, even if I reduce the amount of the work, the contract sum, I can the performance bond still stand as it is. That is no not, nothing whatsoever to say that if the contract sum reduced, your performance bond sum will be reduced as well. So there's no such thing. Then of course that's to say that the removal, the omission of a certain portion of the work does not affect some tax obligation under the contract. And then the, on the issue of uh, back charges. The Court of Duty thinks that, held that the cost incurred it was for the rectification work. And uh, Sumatek has also acknowledged that there was, MRC did tell previously that there was, there might be a potential claim. So Sumatek also acknowledged that. And uh, in relation to what Sumatek says, we are negotiating, we are trying to settle. Then the Court of Duty said that the negotiation has been unduly prolonged and it's basically just which are still made and nothing is moving. And hence, and the Court of Appeal disagreed with Somatec's contention that it is unconscionable because of the reduced, I mean, one of the grounds was that the reduced sum, contract sum. Federal Court agreed with the uh, Court of Appeal and also the, the recognized that unconscionability is a, is a distinct ground to restrain the calling of performance, performance bond. And, uh, but however, on the facts of the case, they agree with call of view and say that no unconscionability. And hence that this injunction was not allowed. Okay, next case, I have four cases. This is the second one. Let me look at my time. I'm running a bit. I'll try to finish as much as, uh, as fast as possible. So this case is pretty interesting. It's uh, BGM against uh, Petronas. So this case involves bribery, what they call a corporation fee. 
So BGM was appointed by Petronas to, con to construct certain, stuff, certain uh, things. So what BGM said in the uh, cost paper was that Petronas was being absolutely difficult. They were very unreasonable, receiving har harassing treatment, and that BGM stated that there was a pattern that all these treatments which make them which make it so difficult and just so unbearable to continue working with the defendants. And BGM also say in their cost paper, in their affidavit, basically in their injunction application, say that they were so difficult uh, with us, it was because I refused to give them a corporate fees, uh, cooperation fees that they asked for. So in the in the judgment, they actually put in. I mean, I can see from the judgment that they put in the transcript between what was uh, transpired between the DJM and the uh, CNS consultant who asked for the cooperation fee. It was recorded and they put in, in the, the transcript with the affidavit. And what the CNS consultant asked was a two percent of contract sum, rounded up to three hundred thousand. Do I have time to show your? This is a judgment of uh, BJM and Paterna at paragraph 17. Yes. If y'all can see, can um, Vivian, can see right? Yeah, can see. Okay. So, Edit Ng, Edit Ng at paragraph 77, Edit Ng is the CNS consultant. So, it was it says, lah. okay. This is one of, uh, okay, paragraph 70, paragraph 26. This is the co cooperation piece that I was telling uh, you guys. 2% of the contract sum and round it up to 300,000. So this was what uh, Adin has asked for. Over and on top of that, he also said that, okay, um, for whatever saving that you got, I want to split it with you, three and seven, four and six. All these things was recorded and it was tendered as evidence. So he I didn't go ahead, I'll go further and say that okay, I'll come up with a design, then after I'll approve it, and then all this saving we will share. So what happened then in that in that case? Okay, so this is the corporation fees part where I want to share with you. This was uh, in the judgment, stated in the judgment by uh, Justice Mary Lim. So after Bijan refused to give uh, the corporation fees, and then uh, that is what uh, Bijan said, lah. and the uh, petrol wants make it even harder for them. And hence, I have, I have no choice but I have to terminate the contract. So, this termination, this letter of termination was not addressed by petrol at all. That was from the termination up until the moment that uh, uh, petrol decided to address this termination issue, it was about a couple of months left. Lah. But in between this uh, couple of months, Petronas keep writing letters, start to say a lot of things already. And then only one month or two months later, then he was like, okay, now let's address the letter of termination that you issued to me like a few months ago. So this part of the, this part of what happened, okay, uh, I'll, I'll show you that part of the judgment later. So what Justice Mary Lim says is that, like what I've said as well, the uh, share with you that unconscionability is a fact specific, and hence we need to look at the circumstances of the case specifically. There is no one uh, checklist to say that oh, all these are uh, unconscionability, unconscionable conduct. So what um, her ladyship said uh, held is that but the bribery incident did take place, and then. She go on to say, uh, her ladyship go on to say that Patronas ought to have put in more effort and to address BGM's concern in view of the uh, uh, in, in view of the awareness of the bribery. So I want to share with you all the part of the judgment. Paragraph. The chronology of the event revealed that it was actually the defendant, in this case Patronas, who chose not to reply to the plaintiff's letter of termination and instead set about preparing a case to provide justification for a subsequent call on the bank guarantee. So this is also one of the uh, reasons the court actually held ultimately that there was an uh, issue of uh, unconscionability and hence 
the application for injunction by BGM was allowed in that case. That's one incident. And uh, the next one. So Aeropad was, um, uh, this is a case of Dungung Jaya and the Aeropad. Aeropad was appointed by Dungung to carry out certain construction work again. And then, uh, of course, Aeropad took out bank guarantees, pre very pre-standard stuff. And uh, what happened is that Dungung gave EOT until February of 2016 to complete the work. There was delay, but they gave EOT. But before the, four months before the uh, time's up, the extended time, the uh, Dungung unilaterally terminated the contract and then called on the performance force. Despite you still have four more months to go. So the court held that all this taken cumulatively. Okay, what is what are all these? It was actually in the paragraph 26 of the judgment that looking at all these things together, and hence there is there is a degree as to prick the conscience of a reasonable man and sensible man. And hence, the application for injunction was actually allowed. So what are the things that was, uh, what are the cumulative facts that leading to that conclusion? So I need, I need to jump here and there a little bit because I want to show, I want to share with you. And it's, it's, a, it's a very long judgment. I don't want to put everything in the slides and, uh, and it will be very hard to see. It's too small. So this is the part I, I want to show you the list of things that the court actually looked at. Again, similar wording. On the facts, it is clear that the first respondent had engineered a situation to unfairly to unfairly avoid making payment of sums due and owing to the appellant. So these are the things that the court looked at by not certifying, by wrongfully deducting, under certification, fail to issue uh, appellant a certificate for the release of the first 2.5 retention sum, delay in certification, certified LAD so that you can deduct what they are supposed to pay, terminating the contract when the delay was only 3.9 to 5.5 to 5 percent all this the notice of termination was made, was made in bad faith the fact that the extension of time was given but still you go ahead to terminate when there's still got like four four five months left so all this taken together that's where the court say that at paragraph 27 all this taken cumulatively amount to unconscionability so again there's no one set. You, the court actually look at all these things from A to J and say that there was unconscionability and there was unfairness and hence the court has to step in. Yeah, like what I say, they were so lacking in good faith. So at the end, the injunction was allowed. So that is Bing Bing. The last case is uh, Sino Hydro. Sanya Hydro is a case where Golden Horse appointed, awarded um, the contract for the construction of a tire factory in Klang to um, Sino Hydro. So the contract sum was 31.1 million. So uh, there was some advance payment given, and hence, pursuant to the contract, Sino Hydro had to give an advance payment guarantee and also a performance security of 1.56 million. So the issue now is actually the performance security of the uh, one point the one point six one point five performance uh, security. There was allegation of a uh, delay, of course, and uh, so the material facts to be considered between uh, before the judge was actually at paragraph forty seven, and uh, what the court actually say. Oops, cannot stop ready. Okay, so basically at the end, what the court actually said that the Golden Horse failed to satisfy the condition precedent to entitle him to demand and utilize the performance security. And at the same time, the calling of the performance bond when the work actually has been practically completed, finished already, but you still go on call. And of course, the court actually go and, and, uh, uh, and on one note like that I would like to point out is that the court actually take commercial said that there is a real risk damage to commercial reputation standing and credit with needs of Sino Hydro. So what the court actually say in the judge, 
Richmond was that a very real risk of damage to the commercial reputation of the plaintiff. The fact that the plaintiff is a wholly owned subsidiary of a global state owned enterprise incorporated in the Republic in the People's Republic of China and carries a brand name which is world renowned as a leader in the construction industry are relevant factors to be taken into consideration. So the court actually take into consideration that the fact that a calling of a performance bond is successful, it, it can bring irreparable damage to the reputation of the contractor. Okay, so in that case, the injunction was allowed as well. So last, uh, I'm done almost. So tips for benefit, actually for both beneficiary and I mean the um, employer and the contractor is that please pay close attention to the performance bond because that is the, the contract that whether you want to call or whether you want to restrain, you want to receive an injunction, that is the most important thing. Although usually it's just like a one page kind of thing. Ensure that the wording of the performance bond clear is clear and unequivocal and reflect the true intention of the parties. And uh, if you are the beneficiary and you are calling the bond, look at the uh, performance bond itself. Look at it and see what are the requirements. If it's a demand on demand, you need to assert a bridge, go ahead and do it in your demand. And of course, anything not sure, come and look, uh, seek legal advice before you call. Well, tip for the contractor principle, whenever, whenever possible, try to negotiate, like, see if you can have a condition stick to your performance bond. I know it's not easy and uh, most of the time the templates will really be given. So you just have to take it and uh, go to the bank and get it done. So, but well, having said that, try. Never try, never know. And uh, if you know, if you are prompted that uh, the employer wants to call, uh, the beneficiary is calling on the performance bond, please go and ask, look, uh, prom promptly look for your lawyer and then uh, see if there's any avenue to find an injunction to restrain the calling of the bond. Whew. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. So sorry to court to take more than the time that I have uh, allocated to me. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Suen. We'll now take questions that some of you have posted on Slido. Okay. You can take my screen. Okay. Okay, the first question we have here. How can the court identify that there are frauds in contracts? Okay. Christine, can you take this question? Sure. Actually, fraud and uh, unconscionability again is really um fact sensitive. Like I said, like you have to, how do court identify me? You have to put in evidence to show up. You plead it in your affidavit, let's say like we are saying, we are talking about um, in the context of a calling of a performance bond. So you need to plead, you need to state it in your affidavit, just like the uh, BGM case that I've just shared, they even put in the transcript, the transcribing of the recording. So all these are evidence, you need to put in evidence to support your contention that there was fraud, you were cheated, there were dishonesty. Christine, we'll go on to the next question. What bonds must I get as a construction company which is trying to bid on a project? Suen, can you take this question? Sure. Um, so as for what kind of bond you have to get for a construction company, it really depends on what's the requirement. Maybe in the tender, there's specific requirements. But over the course of proceedings, let's say if um, the contract, yeah. your, uh, both parties have already agreed, uh, you're only required to get a performance bond when you're asked to. You don't really have to volunteer it, especially if you're the contractor. So it's usually the employer will ask for it, then only you will get the performance bond. Uh, or if it's the term of the contract, uh, construction contract itself, that you must get a performance bond. Thank you, Suan. We have a next question from Lawrence. Developer has their own BG template for contractor to follow. However, banks have their own terms and conditions. Whether contractor should follow the developers or the banks. Christine, can you take this please? Sure. Both of the template, the bank guarantee template, right? For example, actually FIDIC, the FIDIC rate book. In the contract itself, they already enclosed the template. And in the contract itself, they, the obligation on the uh, contractor is to Give a BG based on the template. 
So this then form a part is as a contractual term and hence you will have to follow the template in the construction contract given together with the template. That is for FIDIC. Let's say for example, in normal circumstances where no terms uh, are, no, nothing was agreed in uh, when parties execute the contract. Then later on, the developer say that uh, I want this DG, this template. Where else the bank say that, uh, it, I mean, un under that circumstances, then the bank has their own PNC. Ultimately, right, who, the bond was issued at the request of the developer. So it is, number one, it depends on the terms of the contract, whether it says that the developer has the ultimate say to, to, as to what are the wording and how the, uh, the DG has to be like. I would say la, most of the time, la, because it's for the benefit of the developer. If the developer don't want to accept it, then you are in breach. So I would think that you will have to follow the developer. Next one we have from Adam. Can the termination of the contract be one-sided? So Anne? Thanks, Raven. Um, so whether the contract you can terminate one sided or not, it depends on the clause of your contract. So uh, most contract will have would have specifically state circumstances in which one party can terminate the contract. So you really have to look at the contract. Uh, it, but in the event you choose to terminate one sidedly and go against the terms of the contract, you run the risk of bridging the contract yourself uh, because you have terminated it prematurely. Okay, yeah, I would like to add, termination is actually a, a contractual right, put it that way. Lah. And hence, like what you have said, the contract would spell out who has the right to terminate. That is uh, the contractual right of uh, termination. There's actually common law of termination as well. So usually the termination will be one-sided. I mean, unless party like mutually, uh, mutually to agree to terminate, then of course no problem. Right? That's where, but when people come to court and argue this and argue that, it was because they say that you have what you have unlawfully terminated the contract unilaterally, and hence that's why you are in breach. So the question of whether it is true, whatever that I just said is true or not, the court then will look at whether that law that termination is lawful or not, and they will look at the terms of the contract, and they will look at common law. Thank you, Suen. Thank you, Christine. Next one we have here. How can performance bond be supported? Christine, can you take this, please? How can a performance bond be supported? I don't really understand the question, be supported. <laughs> I think what, what um, Adele is asking is whether what what form of what form of guarantee is it? What what? Well, performance bond is usually a bank guarantee. Yeah, I I I I'm not able to answer. I don't really understand the question. Yeah. Um, Adele, if if you can, maybe you can uh, explain your question um by posting a follow up question, and we'll get yeah. to your question get to your question later. Okay. Next one we have here. Yeah. Um, the difference between High Court and Appeal Court. I think this was due when Christine was explaining the case laws. Uh, Christine, can you explain to Adam on this? Sure. So, like, for example, Sumatek. In Malaysia, there's five courts. We have uh, the lower court is magistrate. Then up, you have sessions. Then you have High Court. All these courts are the courts of first instance. Then only if you're not happy with the decision, you appeal. So, appellate, uh, then you can appeal to Fed, uh, Court of Appeal and Federal Court. So that is the, the, the hierarchy, so to speak. So in terms of uh, which, first of, which court of first instance you go to, it depends, for example, the amount of claims. For below 100,000, you go to magistrate. Be above 100,000, below 1 million, you go to session. Above 1 million, you go to high court. So there's different, different uh, appellate procedures as well. For magistrate, you appeal to high court. Then high court, you appeal to court of appeal. For if you start in high court, you appeal to court of appeal, then you go up to federal court, but this leave. So there are certain criteria, certain things that you have to take into consideration, whether which court and where to appeal to. How can the court identify that they are fraud? That was the same question. 
Yeah, I think um, Christine has answered that question. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to the next one. Does a determination letter need to be sent to the contractor first before making the, the demand on the performance bond? Christine, can you take this? Okay, I mean, I think what they asked was the termination and making of performance bond. I mean, the demand of the performance bond. Actually, they are both different issues. Terminating the contract doesn't mean that uh, right away you can call for the performance bond. Likewise, by you not terminating the contract doesn't mean that you cannot call uh, for the performance bond as well. It's a two separate uh, issue. Thank you, Christine. Okay, that's the end of our Q&A session for today. Thank you for your questions and sharing your insights with us, Christine and Suen. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Firstly, please join us again for our upcoming talks. On the 9th of September, um, our firm's partner, Gan Chong Chie, and our senior associate, Diana Chek, will be giving a talk on partnership dissolution and distribution of partnership assets. Um, and then on the 23rd of September, our partner, Sarah Kambali, and our associate, Anis Sohaimi, we'll talk about preparing for the unexpected in Awasia drafting. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what uh, you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. If you have any other questions, which we did not manage to answer earlier, please fill it in our feedback form and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our, improve our MWK online talk series for you in the future. Thirdly, please do follow, our like, follow or like our social media accounts. Fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted in the chat. To our guests, thank you for joining us um, for our talk today. We hope you have, a, you have found today's session very informative and useful. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you at our next talk. Mm -hmm.